Welcome to the Magic Tutorial, where those unfamiliar with the game of magic are initiated into its mysterious ways. Magic is a game of cards, which hold within them mighty spells and powers undreamt of on the mortal plane. You access these mighty magics by building decks of cards, carefully selecting a balance of creatures, lands, spells, and artifacts that will work together to vanquish your wizardly opponents. The ways of magic are complex, and it will take some time to learn the game's many subtleties. But heed what we say, you will soon be trading spells with the masters. And so, we begin. Magic begins with the land, and from the land comes the power to cast spells and summon creatures. We call this magical power mana, and it is fundamental to the play of magic. There are five different types of land, and each type of land grants the power to cast a different color of spell. In order to cast a red spell, you'll need some red mana, which must be drawn from a mountain card. You may now click below to find out what kind of mana the other lands produce. When you're done, click done, and we'll continue. Red spells draw their power from mountains and are usually spells of destruction and mayhem. A personal favorite of mine. White spells require mana drawn from planes and represent the forces of healing and protection. Not that a Sarah Angel or two couldn't be used to deal some damage as well. Blue spells draw their mana from islands and represent the powers of trickery and deception. <laughs> Black spells draw their mana from the swamps and represent the sinister powers of decay, corruption, and pestilence. And that's on a good day. Green spells draw their mana from the forest and represent the awesome powers of nature and the life force, as any scaled worm could tell you. As a magic player, you must construct a deck out of creatures, lands, and spells. A deck is built out of cards you have carefully selected to rub your opponent out. A deck usually consists of between 40 and 60 cards, and is usually based on spells of two or three different colors, along with the land cards needed to cast those colors. You play magic by drawing cards from your deck, and playing them in various ways to damage, confuse, confound, and otherwise foil the carefully laid plans of your opponent, while they try to do the same to you. As you will soon learn, there are magic cards that can do just about anything, and the joy of magic comes in finding new ways to use different cards in devious and destructive combinations. Now you must learn how, with the interface. demonstrate the magic interface by actually playing a genuine card. So stick with us. First of all, behold a land card. A mountain, which the lovely sorceress has drawn from her library and put into play. Behold! The libraries. One for you, one for your opponent. This is where the cards you haven't drawn yet await you. To see that mountain card in more detail, touch it with your cursor, and it will appear in the card window so that you can examine it closely. So go ahead and touch it, for practice. Now once this mountain card is in play, you can tap it to get one point of red mana, represented by the fireball symbol. To tap a card means to use that card. Tapped cards turn sideways to show that they're tapped. Ah, mana. Tapping a land card adds its mana to your mana pool, which looks like this. Again, one for you, one for your opponent. Since a mountain has been tapped, there is one point of red mana in the pool. 
You can now use the mana to cast another spell in your hand, such as this lightning bolt here. The lightning bolt requires one point of red mana and allows you to sling lightning at an opponent's creature, or even your opponent. Allow me. <clears throat> Zap. I have now damaged my hapless foe for three points of damage, which is subtracted from his life points, here. When your life points hit zero, that's it. Duel over. So try to keep the points up. Of course, a well-prepared wizard wouldn't have to stand there and get fried. For example, I might have an interrupt spell, such as this blue elemental blast. By tapping an island... If you have an untapped island to spare... I can interrupt her spell, sending it directly to... The Graveyard. The Graveyard is where used up spells and destroyed creatures linger. You can look in either graveyard by clicking on it. And on that lovely note, we'll move on to spell casting. To be a successful wizard, you have to learn how to manage your spells. You cast a spell by paying its casting cost, represented in the upper right corner of the card. As we know, the casting cost of the lightning bolt is one red mana. Many spells have colorless mana in their casting cost, such as this shatter spell. The number in the gray circle means that one mana of any color is necessary to cast the spell, in addition to the one red mana. Which brings us to our first... Quiz quiz! Yes, that's right! Test your knowledge and earn exciting prizes as well. Today's topic is... Spell casting. And the question is... What combination of cards below would you tap to cast this spell? Go! We're waiting! No, I'm sorry. Let me untap them so you can try again. It's a tricky one, but you need two black mana and two more mana of any color to cast the spell. <laughs> That's absolutely right! To cast this spell, you need two black mana from the swamps, and two more mana of any type. Congratulations! Here's another interesting spell. Fireball, that will let you do damage equal to the amount of additional mana you tap, shown by the X in the circle. It can toast up a creature quite nicely. Unless you have a spell like an instant or an interrupt that can be cast in response to your opponent's actions. These are called fast effects. A handy fast effect is this blue one summon spell, which will bring a creature back into my hand before it gets toasted. And with all this talk of creatures, perhaps it's time to show one in more detail. No deck would be complete without some creature cards. While in your hand, these cards represent spells which summon the appropriate creature, putting it into play in your territory. Today's featured creature is the Grey Ogre, which, when summoned... With one red and two colorless mana... ...becomes a creature in play. The two numbers down at the bottom of the card represent the creature's power and toughness, which are two and two. The power of two means that the ogre can deal two points of damage in combat. And the toughness of two means that the ogre can absorb two points of damage before being removed from play in two. The graveyard. The sun creatures also have special powers or can gain special powers from spells. Click on the list below to find out what a few of these powers are. And now the moment you've been waiting for. We will begin a duel. And along the way there will be combat, carnage, lightning will fly, creatures will fall, and you'll learn something about the phases of a magic turn. A 
A magic game begins with each player drawing seven cards and ends when one player's life points reach zero, or they can no longer draw cards from their library. The first two phases of the game are untap, in which you untap all of your tapped cards, and upkeep, in which you perform various tasks that some cards may require. With nothing in play right now, I would skip these two phases and move on to draw. I draw a card and arrive at the main phase. During the main phase, you can play a land, declare an attack, and cast spells in any order. First, I would play a land by clicking on it. Since without land, I can't generate any mana. You can only play one land per turn and with no one mana casting cost spells in my hand and no creatures to attack with, I'll end my turn by clicking the end button. The last two phases are discard, in which you discard any cards above seven in your hand, and heal, in which all creatures that survived combat are healed. Of which I have none, so control passes to my opponent. I'll draw a card and then play a swamp. I have no one casting cost spells that I want to play, so I'll end my turn as well. Go ahead and click end to help me out. I draw a card and then play another mountain. At this point, I'd like to play a forest, because then I could use the green mana to help summon some elvish archers. But I have no forest, so I'll just eye my opponent uneasily and pass control. And now the game gets interesting. I'll draw, play a swamp, and tap the two black mana to summon a black knight, a 2-2 two -two creature with some special powers. <laughs> Whenever a creature is first summoned, it can't attack. We call this summoning sickness. But next turn, the carnage begins. Unless I can get a creature out to block with. I draw a card, and it's the forest I've been waiting for. I play it, and with the Black Knight eyeing me balefully, I know I have some choices to make. Then let's stop the game for a moment and talk about combat. The basics of combat are simple. A player declares one or more attackers during their turn. The opposing player declares one or more blockers for each attacker, and the combat is resolved. Sounds simple, but like so many simple things, it's not. In this case, my magic-wielding foe has summoned a black knight, and I now have enough mana to summon either a gray ogre or my elvish archers. The black knight is a 2-2 two -two creature, and the Grey Ogre is a 2-2 two -two creature. So let's say I summon my Grey Ogre. The next turn, I declare my Black Knight as an attacker. And I declare defenders. I could declare no defenders, in which case the Black Knight rushes through and attacks me. That would be lame. So I declare my Grey Ogre as a defender. So the Black Knight does two points of damage against the Ogre's two toughness, killing it. But the ogre also does two points against the knight's two points of toughness, killing it. A trade-off. <laughs> yes, but... Mm -hmm. My black knight has special powers, unlike your plain vanilla ogre. The knight's powers are protection from white, which doesn't do any good against your red creature, and first strike which means that the knight gets to do damage to the ogre before taking any himself. Thus... The black knight does his two points of damage, killing the ogre before the ogre can deal any damage in return. By the way, other special powers include regeneration, flight, and many more, none of which the ogre has. So he dies and the knight lives to fight on. True, except... Mm -hmm. Except... Except knowing this, I won't summon my ogre, and will instead summon my elvish archers, who also have first strike. Ta-da! Uh-oh. 
Now, when your puny knight attacks, I can block with my archers instead of the ogre. Both the knight and the archers have first strike, so they kill each other. And I'll summon my ogre next turn. Combat. It can get pretty ugly. Let's get back to the game. For reasons that should now be apparent, I've summoned my elvish archers, who stand ready to defend me. They have summoning sickness and can't attack now, so I'll just end my turn. And I'm going to play a land card, an island this time, and declare my knight as an attacker by clicking him. Now, remember that you don't attack creatures directly. You attack your opponent, and the opponent declares blockers. If I declare my archers as blockers, both they and the knight will die. But if I don't declare them, I will take two points of damage. It's a tactical decision. But the knight annoys me, so I'll go ahead and trade creatures. So you declare your elves as blockers? Yes, by clicking them during the declare blockers phase. The knight attacks, the elves defend, everyone dies, it's gruesome. And not so fast. I think now would be the time to revisit fast effects. Oh boy. Instants and interrupts, the so-called fast effects, can be cast in response to any action. So, now that my well-meaning but misguided foe has declared her elves as blockers, I can cast a fast effect, such as this terror spell, which will bury any non-black, non-artifact creature. I don't like the looks of this. I click the spell to cast it, tap the necessary mana, and select the elves to target them. Presto. One batch of dead elvish archers, and my black knight left without a scratch. That hurt. Note that I could have noticed my foe had an abundance of mana to use, and suspected some kind of trickery. But for now, back to the game, which is looking pretty grim. When last we left our noble heroine, her band of elves had been wiped out by my trusty terror spell. Don't leave home without it. I begin my turn by untapping all of my cards, which will let me generate some much needed mana. I play another land, a mountain again, and summon the Grey Ogre. My fiendish foe doesn't know it, but I'm holding a forest in reserve to cast giant growth. An instant that will make my ogre a 5-5 five, five beast. Note that creatures tapped from an attack can't defend. Thus, if she had been able to stop my terror spell, the elves could have run through and damaged me, since my black knight is still tapped from the last attack. Be that as it may, I'll ready my ogre for defending against the black knight, and end my turn. And I'll draw a card play an island, and tap three black mana to summon some scathed zombies. Yuck. Note that you can choose to block an attacking creature with more than one defending creature. Now take a look at this diagram and play with it a while until you understand the basic idea. A defender decides who blocks, and then the attacker decides how damage gets distributed. And now, lovely sorceress, our time grows short. Let us give one last demonstration of how complex a single turn in magic can get. Let's hypothetically say that all my mana is untapped, and so I can cast Unholy Strength on my knight, which will make him a 4-3 creature. I'll also cast a blue flight spell on my knight, which means he can only be blocked by flying creatures. Since your side of the table looks pretty earthbound, he'll fly over and strike you for 4 points of damage. Yes, 
But let's hypothetically say that the night is beginning to get on my nerves. And so I tap a red mana to zap him with a lightning bolt before he can get me. Uh, then let's hypothetically say that I have a blue unsummon spell, which will pull the knight back into my hand before the damage is done. Then let's also say I have a red elemental blast, which interrupts any blue spell such as that unsummon. The knight is helpless. Zap. Ouch. Now that you've had this short introduction, you can peruse the rulebook to learn even more ins and outs of the game. Or just jump right in and play. Until next time.